Welcome to a new series entitled Triumphant. Thank you, Darren. <laughs> Living in continual victory. And you, I know as I say this, some of you are saying, is that possible? Is that just spiritualizing? Is that, you know, lingo speak easy? Is that photobombing spirituality, if you can say? No, it's not. Because scripture says this, and I would like to ask you to read this aloud with me so we declare truth in spite of what you feel or what you're going through. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, can we read this together? Now, thanks be to God. Okay. Was there a delay in the sound signal? Okay. They used to do this in the Old Testament. They would stand in the reading of, of, of the scripture. Okay. Let's do this again. Ready? Go. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. There is nothing like the sweet aroma, the smell of continual victory. Many of you understand that, whether you're in business, uh, in a relationship, in sports, or you highlight moments, you wish you could bottle that moment and have it continue. But you know what? Victory is not only victory when you're winning. When it appears like you're losing, you can be winning. And God's view of things are very different than ours. The source and the foundation of enduring triumph is love. Love conquers all. It's the greatest force in the universe. We know this because the Bible says God, not only does God love us, he is love. And he comes through his son to live in our hearts by his Holy Spirit. When we receive him, we receive the power of love, the source of all triumph. Scripture says here, and it's probably in every NFL stadium, some guy with a banner. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God so loved that he gave. I mean, this is incredible sacrifice. The author goes down in 12 chapters later, greater love, Jesus is saying, is no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. The scripture says our greatest enemy is death. And death is conquered by what scripture says is our greatest power, the love of God. God so loved that he sent his son for us, to die for us, to pay the price of our sin for us, to set us free, and he waits for us to then surrender our hearts to him. And thereby we begin a relationship. There's things that you will do for others, as we've said before, that you'd never do for yourself. Parents, you would gladly lay down great sacrifice for your children or your grandchildren. It's instinctive. Husbands and wives, wives and husbands, the same way, soldiers in battle. Love will cause us to do for others what we won't even do for ourselves. And when we receive Christ into our lives, the potential the capacity, the source of unbelievable, triumphant power for enduring, relentless, unyielding victory is in our hearts. But there's a fuel for love, and the fuel for love is found in intimacy. It's intimacy. And so Jesus, he, he, here he, he brings out the greatest intimacy in his relationship with his father, the son and the father. He says, I and my father are one, one. Well, there's no greater intimacy than divine intimacy. And when Jesus came and he sacrificed his life for us, the gospel, he came because he so loved the Father and had the heart of the Father for us, there was no way he could do anything else. His loving oneness with his Father caused him to leave heaven, to become the form of a child and man as he grew up. And eventually he went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. He rose again, breaking its grip and power over our lives. And he waits to be received by men and women everywhere to begin an intimate relationship. But you know what? This intimacy he wants for us. Check out what is known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ before he goes to the cross. John 17. He says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you love me. 
before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. And I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have, you have for me may be in them. That is Jesus' prayer. And that I myself may be in them. This is the immense cry of the heart of God for intimacy with us. The love that the Son has for the Father, he wants, us to, be, wants to be in us. But, and he goes another, the ultimate intimacy, but I want to live in them, and that's the born-again born experience. I was telling the earlier service that coming to church and doing things for God does not bring us into a relationship with God. In a religious society where the gospel has been watered down, we must remember that Jesus Christ, the Lord, must be personally received into our hearts. And he must be made Lord. And we then give our lives to him. See, Jesus didn't just come to give us a blessing. He, gave us to, he came to give us himself. And what he looks for is for us to give of ourselves to him. It's a mutual intimacy. There's no fun in loving somebody who don't love you back, right? even though Jesus calls us to do that, that we might illustrate the, the love of God to others that, that need the love of God. And it, he says here, I, I just don't want to be with you. I want to live in you. And all he needs is our permission. Say, Lord, I want to be born again. I, 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 I want to have an intimate relationship with you. Because until we come to that point, we have no relationship with God. We may think we do. We have a mental belief, but until there is a receiving where the Lord lives within us, there is no power, the power of love that rules over all. Now, here, here's, here's what I want to say. You know, intimacy, it, it's got some disciplines to it. When you have an intimate relationship with someone, whether it's a friendship, a marriage, a courtship, there are things you do to develop love, isn't that true? Love in relationships, humanly speaking, starts with a spark of passion and emotion. We want that to continue, the feeling, the urge, the passion, the feeling, the shakes, the euphoria, the dopamine drops. We want that to, and we have to be married for 33 years, there are moments you're on air. It's faith, baby. But it's those places that make love go deeper if we understand the season of the desert. And that's another message. But there are things you do that to keep the fire burning. It's the practice of intimacy that brings the power of intimacy. And here's one thing we must understand. Intimacy can't be rushed. You can't skim. You can't, you can't fast forward or super speed or 2x or 3x relationships. You just can't. You can't do it horizontally. You can't do it vertically. And so when we understand this, it, 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 starts, it starts to make sense that when we hit speed bumps in our lives that the Lord allows to come before us, he wants to slow us. He doesn't want to shut us down like the government, but he wants to slow us down. Very important. In, in, in his book, Renewing Your Spiritual Passion by Gordon MacDonald, a classic. Okay, I would get that book if I were you. All right, he brings out a story from author Letty Coleman's book, Springs in the Valley, a classic. And she talks about this, I want to read it to you. In the deep jungles of Africa, a traveler was making a long trek. It was an American traveler. Okay, wanting to do the African tour, the bush, the whole deal. The coolies had been engaged from a tribe to carry the loads. The first day they marched rapidly and went far. The traveler had high hopes of a speedy journey, typical American. But the second morning, these jungle tribesmen refused to move. And all the type A people here probably went, why? For some strange reason, they just sat and rested. On inquiry as to the reason for this strange behavior, the traveler was informed that they had gone too fast the first day, and they were now simply waiting for their hearts and souls to catch up with their bodies. Africans would continue to say in another setting, you Americans live by achievement, but we find God has made us for relationship. Ouch. Isn't that interesting? And you can't live 
have great relationships living fast and furious and busy and speedy. But you could try. Hi, how are you? I love you. Hi, let's do it. Right? You can't. How dumb is that? And so when I look at a fast and furious American economy that was on the rise, all of a sudden we have a government shutdown. That's the Lord's way of saying, slow down. We think it's the house of representatives. I would suggest to you, God could do this and we could prosper. God could do this and the shutdown would end. God could hike our economy like this. But he's calling us to look at the dollar bill now, which says at the top, in God we trust. I was talking to a business person this past week. And she shuts down her business on Sunday, for which she was criticized. She said, don't you realize that in your line of work, you could have so much more revenue if you opened on Sunday? To which she replied, yeah, but I'd rather live in obedience to the Lord and what he's telling me in my heart than to do what's logical economically. She began to also say that I believe that if I live in that intimate obedience and do what he's spoken in my heart to do, that he will more than make up for Sunday by prospering me from Monday through Saturday. And I went, that's a guest spot. That's amazing. Where, where did she hear that? I'm reading a book? No, she heard it in here. Now, that's her. I'm not saying that's for all of you, so please don't, you know, don't go, oh, the pastor, you're trying to manipulate us, okay? No, now, I'm saying because, and this, and this person is, spends regular time in prayer, slows herself to hear the voice of God. She heard the Lord speak something to her that's worked for her. And she's doing fine. Thank you. I ask you who's in control. And sometimes the government shutdown is a reminder to all of us. He wants to be the one in control. He is more than enough. He is the one who gives continual victory, eternal triumph, if we do it his way. Because here's why. The fruit of intimacy is a life lived with obedience and accuracy. Because when you're, when, you're, when you're one with the Lord, you start to hear his heartbeat. Jesus was crucified of all things. He was, he was, he was being criticized, I'm sorry, for uh, being too busy on what was known as the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. They said, you're doing religious works, Jesus, on the Sabbath. And of course, the religious people of that day, religious leaders had the definition and the purpose of the Sabbath all whacked. It was supposed to be a day to cease from economic labor, personal busyness to focus on the Lord and family relationships. And so Jesus was doing that. But see, he was being criticized. And so this was his defense. This was his defense. He said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day. And I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. What? See, because breaking the Sabbath wrongly, uh, the outcome was death. But not only was he breaking the Sabbath, he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And Jesus gave them this answer. Verily, very truly, I say to you, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. So this businesswoman was pretty much telling her business, her business peers, saying, I'm just doing, you do what you do, but I got to do what the father's telling me to do. And right now, he's telling me to shut down on Sunday. And when you live in the place of total obedience, you continue to live in the place of total triumph and victory. See, but that... Where do you, how do you hear? You hear by slowing down and having regular times with the Lord in prayer. People have asked me, how for 40 years have you just continued to love the Lord and grow? And in the minute, I tell them, you know what? The number one reason is just regular time with God. Prayer. Not the word. That's second. The Bible's clear. We can know about God through the word. But it's through prayer and really spending time communing with the Lord, talking to him, letting him talk back to you. That's where it happens. And there are times the Lord will sovereignly reveal himself to you. 
If you're faithful, there are times God breaks out into your soul, his voice becomes clear, his presence can be felt. But most of the time in my life, that hasn't been the case. I have felt nothing. I'm not one of those highly emotional people. Some people, they just start praying and they start seeing visions and weeping. That's not me. But I understand that the Lord is always there by faith. He's always listening. He always loves me. He's always talking to me. So oh, for 40 years, I said, Lord, continue to teach me how to discern your voice to live your direction. Because when I live in the place of obedience, I live in the place of victory. Even though all hell may seem to break loose, if I know I've hearkened to your leading, it's good. See, that's why we tithe. When, when you live, you go, wow, where did that come from? Jesus talked about money more than any other thing other than love in the Bible. We, sometimes we are afraid to talk about it. No, I'm not going to be afraid today. I'm going to say this. See, that's why for times like this, when you tithe, you have invested the tenth of your income. That's a hedge of protection around you. And the promise of God, because he loves you, and you've tithed because you love him, there's an intimacy and a peace that passes all understanding. And you don't worry, because here's what the scripture says. The government is on his shoulders. I'm sorry. And when we look up, guess what? God don't shut down. He's in charge, not the House of Representatives, not our president. He's in charge. And when we live in the zone of obedience, that's where the tide says it's not an option. We, it's to remind us we give because we love him, because we remember he loves us. And now these are the times where the promises of God and the grace of God kick in. Are you listening? Huge. And you don't want to, so it's like this businesswoman. You don't just, you don't go, oh my God. Oh my God, the government's shutting up. Oh my God, oh my God. No, see, when you have these regular times with the Lord, there's these random breakthroughs. And when hell seems to break loose, you go, hmm, it's good. God is in control. He loves me. I love him. I'm doing the best I can living in the way he told me to live. It's going to be fine but here's what I got to do. I got to take what I got and go share it with the unreached. I got to go share it with people that don't have that peace. Because when we have his love, do you think it's right for us to keep it? I was a little weak. Let me ask again. When we have his love, do you think it's okay to just keep it to ourselves? No. no. And especially at this time, we need to say, look, his government... The government is on his shoulders. Psalm chapter 37, a familiar passage, tells us this. Take delight in the Lord, words of King David. He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture, but it fits today. The original language really means this. As we put our delight in God, he will cause his desires to be our desires. There's a transformation and a transmutation of our soul. And that's intimacy. It's like when I married Faye, Faye married me, I took on a lot of her passions and desires and vice versa because that's what connection does. And when we connect with the Lord, we grab more of his heart and all of a sudden, the things we were afraid of that they, we didn't want to become or do before, we want to because the spirit of God is working a work of inner transformation. And that connection of love and relations, a lot of you uh, spouses that are married, you start, you start acting like each other, gestures, facial expressions, it's really funny, you know? I, 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 you, I, 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 will, I will stop. People start mimicking people that they're very good friends with and they don't really realize they're doing it. There's, a, there's something, there's a, there's a transformation and a transformation and a transference in intimacy. And, we, and the scripture says here, we're just taking on the desires of God. Now, I'm going to meddle today just for a moment. I did it in the first service and they survived. Every end of September to the end of October, pastors in Hawaii notice there's a tremendous attendance drop in churches. We have our ideas as to why it is, but we know there comes a tremendous distraction that hits during that one month period. I've tracked it 
for years. And uh, generally is because we get distracted with many things, but we forget the main things that are disciplines of intimacy that keep us connected. There are 168 hours in a week, unless the Lord has changed that recently and didn't tell me. Many families with young kids in sports, they'll go 10 hours a week in practice, another two hours for a game, so that would be 12 hours. You know where I'm going with this. Some of you are sharp, you're going, hurry up, hurry up, okay? No, I'm going to slow down like the coolies. <sighs> You all right? Okay, that's good. I'm checking. And this is the age, all right? This is the age where everybody wants their kid to be the next Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, and sports rules the day. And we have games on Sunday everywhere. I see our church people at, park, at parks everywhere. Here's what goes through my mind as a pastor. Though you're meddling, get up in your thing now. I ask myself, this weekend in one of our nine services, were they in the house? Were they in the house? Now, some of you are going, legalism, legalism, work, 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 relax. It's a command of the Bible not to forsake the gathering of yourselves together. It's just for instance, Billy took his son to UH football game, and that, that was a little disappointing, I realize, but that's about, about a four hour experience counting drive time, maybe a little over. We all do many things that are important. We go to gym workouts, everything I do. But they say time reflects your devotion and priority. A church service is an hour, 15 minutes if you come on time. <laughs> Some people, it's an hour experience. <laughs> Small groups, about an hour to an hour, 15 minutes. That'd be like two and a half hours a week. I know, the jo I know what it is to take your kids to soccer practice, all this kind of stuff, and the busyness and the fatigue. But as your pastor, when I hear stuff like, I was too busy and I was too tired, I go for two hour and a half hours a week, the Lord who gave you his all didn't deserve a two hour, two and a half hour block. Something is wrong. Thank you. Something is wrong. When a football game that goes three and a half hours in one sitting trumps two and a half hours of a structured place of discipleship and devotion to God. Great. Now, listen, you're talking to the former chaplain of the UH football team when it was winning. <laughs> I'm a sports nut. You ask my wife, I am a sports fan, a sports fiend. I played terribly, but did play. I, uh, listen, I believe that. We, we're, we're known to be a church with the most men of most congregations. Because You know why they talk to tell me? Because you tell sports stories. That's why we come. And then they got saved. So women, just, just let me take a moment. Last week I did the chapel. They, they had to call me back because Joe Onosai couldn't do it. And I said, oh, you know, I don't. And um, so I got in there and did it. And I f it felt like coming home, Really. Got to know Coach Chow, sat with the coaches. They wanted me to come on the field, do all that. I said, no, I'm busy. It's not over. I didn't even listen to the game until Joe Onosai texted me from the mainland. He says, hey, are you getting this? Getting what? Turn on the radio. From 43, 42 to 3, it was 42 to 37, and we were 40 yards away from beating a nationally ranked team. So understand this. And I, I stopped meditating on the messages. I stopped doing work for sports. That's honest. I stopped. I started listening to the radio, getting on stats online. You, and I, and I, felt, I, felt, I felt a little weird because this is usually sermon preparation time and prayer time. I threw all that out for a UH football game, for a team that hadn't won yet. <laughs> I'm doing this, right? But my, I was displaced. I wonder how much displacement we allow to come in that creeps a little by little that steals intimacy with God. Ooh, live, live, live. And watch this now. Here's what went through my mind. You see now, you spent uh, four hours with the team last week before they played Fresno State. Well, counting preparation. 
Now you're also listening to the game. This is the thought that came to me. Not that this being legalistic. Has there been a displacement of time here? that should have belonged to something else? Should you not have been continuing to work on the thing you were working on? This is not legalism. But I'm saying, look, add it up. Four hours of UH football, plus I'm all excited because they might win this game in what is an absolute miracle, and my ears are really, because the volume thing was, something was wrong with the volume thing on my computer. So I was like this. I was reduced to this. Don't let yourself be reduced to that. He gave his all. Train your children. We will fight to get to group. We will fight to serve. We will fight to share our faith. We will fight to be in God's house. And your children and your grandchildren will remember not what you said, but what you did. Not when it was easy, but when it was difficult. That, trust me. And I think that fight needs to return because here's what I find, the first thing that kicks, gets kicked out is church. It ought not to be. And when God says, I need to catch the attention of my church, first of all, he knows the American's primary value is money, so he shuts the government down. It's a slowdown, not really a shutdown. You don't want to see a shutdown. Are you listening? Can you do that? I do this all the time, all right? But I think it's time something be said in this hour. The fruit of intimacy. But you know what? There comes a time as we close today. No matter how well we're living, God is designed like he did for Jesus who learned obedience through the things that he suffered. There comes a time that the fire of adversity must forge a deeper intimacy in our lives. It's just the way we're made. It's just the way, the theme of human suffering, the theme of life, no one is exempt from this. And when Jesus, prior to going to the cross, knowing this is why he came, he went to the Mount of Olives where he had his regular prayer times, the Bible says, and his disciples followed him. And on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. In intimacy, in his most difficult time, he was living in the place of total obedience. He would have to face something insurmountable and overwhelming, and he was in the right place. He was on his knees. And he was digging deep into that oneness for the grace of God, and angels were sent to minister to him. God wants to do the same for you. Run to him, not away from him. Stay close to him, don't move away from him. Because you, as, 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 as Richard led us in worship, you are closer, it's not over. You are closer than you think. And the problem many times is at the heat of the heat, we pull back and we're more comfortable for a moment, but the Lord says, you were so close. Stay in that secret place because there's power that's there, power. Over one half of my staff has come from dire adversity growing up in their past. They don't work for the church. They don't work for me. They work for the Lord because they love him. Because they understand mostly all of them. I would say all of them could have jobs in the marketplace. Many of them have had jobs in the marketplace, have left better paying positions, more prestigious with, to their family and relatives. But because they've heard the Lord say, enter the ministry. They let go of what could have been and they're doing what should be. This is huge. I'm proud of them. And part of the reason why they love Jesus so much is growing up or going through life, they've gone through some hell. But they've gotten real close to the Lord because of that hell and brought heaven into the fire. And because of that love, they do and they serve. This is a team with a great work ethic. I, they do 
Not because they have to, but because they love to. Because they love him and they understand that Jesus gave all. I know these, 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 these men and women could do other things. And we never lose track of that, folks. We never lose track of that. It's not because we have to, but because we love to. Because Jesus loved us, we get to. You know what I'm saying? I want to close today by showing you a clip. But let me set it up. Pastor Saeed Abadini, an American citizen, a dynamic, courageous pastor, is ministering to his people in Iran, where for sharing the gospel where it's illegal to do so, he was captured and put in a Vien prison, one of the world's most notorious, notorious prisons. He's been tortured, he's been threatened, but he's also led over 30 people to the Lord in the process. His wife, Nagme Abedini, shares to Liberty University Convocation the story. So let me not be redundant and let the picture portray a thousand words. Watch this. Good morning, it's great to be here. Um, as you know, my husband, Saeed Abedini, is serving an eight-year sentence in Iran's um, notorious Evan prison, which is one of the worst prisons actually in the world. He's been tortured and abused and um, forced to, re um, he was, he's been asked and uh, tortured to deny his Christian faith and return to Islam. And he has not, they've, uh, they've told him many times that they would free him and allow him to return to our family, the kids and I, if he would deny his Christian faith. And he stood strong in that prison. He's led many, many, over 30 people to Christ in that prison. And he, um, he's endured um, a lot, of, an intense time in that prison. He's been taken to solitary twice because they, in an attempt to break him and have him deny his Christian faith. And the kids and I desperately want him back, but we're proud that over us, he's chosen Christ. Even over coming back to us, he's chosen to stand up for his faith, and not only stand up for his faith, but to proclaim the gospel in that dark prison and bring hope, where many of those people are on death row, have long year, uh, term imprisonments, and for them, for me to know that so many of them now know Christ, make, it, it makes it worth it. I know his imprisonment is not in vain. I wanted to share something quick with you about my testimony. When I heard about his um, imprisonment, I got a call in the middle of the night, and my nightmare in a way started. My whole world was taken from me. Um, our, my future, my best friend, my husband, my uh, the ki uh, fathers to my kids, and my whole future, finances and uh, dreams and everything was taken from me and I'd always feared what would happen if I lost someone or if I would go through an intense trial, if I would question God and his goodness. And I reached a, a deep, dark time of despair and I reached out to Jesus and I've known him since I was nine, but I found the most, um, I connected to him in such a deep way that not only did I not question his goodness, I proclaim his goodness and how awesome he is. And I got to drink of his goodness and he gave me strength to stand up and he's given me joy and peace. I've had atheists and Muslims come up to me and say there's something, there has to be something real about your God because you, you, this is not possible for you to stand up and have so much peace and joy and to be able to give it to us. And you know, the world crumbles under pressure, but we, um, not only survive it, but we uh, thrive because only pressure allows us to even connect deeper with God, Almighty God. We have that. No religion has that. Only Jesus Christ has that. And under pressure, we are broken and we realize our weakness and we can connect to God and we can receive even more joy and peace. And the world doesn't understand it. And the world needs to see that in us. They need to see our, our passionate walk and relationship and love story with Christ. And, um, you know, I, I would always be confused by something uh, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He would say, I take pleasure in my infirmities and in my weakness and my, you know, um, distress. And how, why does he take pleasure? It, the Lord opened it up for me 
during this time because he realizes how weak he is and he discovers the strength of Christ. And I just want to end with this. I want to say, you know, in this trial, I've, found, I've tasted a new um, intimacy. I've, I've reached a new intimacy with Christ that I pray that our nation and us as Christians would discover his goodness because the world needs to see our relationship and our fire, our, our, the truth of Jesus Christ. She's, her husband may not make it out. He hasn't seen his children in a year. The sentence is eight years. She's grown up in a very wonderful life. She's known Jesus since she was nine. And yet she talks about a greater intimacy. Because sometimes we can put our relationship on automatic pilot. We go through the motions. And the Lord knows this. And so in his sovereignty, just like Jesus himself went through Gethsemane, there are times the Lord knows that these moments are meant to pull us close. But if we miss that moment and start shaking our fist at the devil or God or others, we miss the greatest divine appointment that you may ever have in your life that will change you and change others. Since that, out of that moment, she's spoken to the United Nations. She's been put on television in Iran. The underground church there has caused her voice to be multiplied many times over. It's gone viral and global. And what they see from this woman, as she testified to, is the power of love. The power for the love of a Jesus that so loved the world that he gave himself for us. The place of continual obedience is the place of continual victory. Her husband could do a casual denial of the Christian faith and he would be released. Be home with his family, be home with his children, be home with his wife, be home in America, and no one would criticize him. See, but Saeed Abedini knows that wouldn't be what the Lord wants him to do. And sometimes we come to this place where it's difficult. It was Jesus, difficult for Jesus to go through Gethsemane, but love conquers all. And you get that love fueling your soul with regular times in prayer and communion. Talk. What is prayer? Talking to God and letting Him talk back to you. Worshiping Him, loving Him. I use traffic time to become prayer time. I have quit, I have quit now snarling in the Spirit and I'm praying in the Spirit more. It has renovated my view of traffic. And I realize this. We need regular times in prayer got to structure that in where it's in the secret place and you're not rushed and then you need the random times Ragme Abedini has found a new level from when she was nine years old to now in her 30s God wants to transform us and we must allow him to do that if we're going to live in continual victory he is mighty to save he is mighty to deliver I don't know what your battle is I don't know what your suffering is. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know where the slowdown and the shutdown is, but guess what? God is amazing and he's waiting because he's mighty to say, let's stand, let's worship him, shall we?